Hello, my name is Mike Corrali, and this is the Introduction to United States Government course online. Welcome. I'm really happy to be here with you today to introduce you to the first of our lectures titled To Illuminate the Essay, wherein we examine the historical, cultural, economic, and philosophical backgrounds of our founding generation that led them to the crafting of the Declaration of Independence. This lecture was recorded live in front of a U.S. government class just like this. So you, today's listener, should get a glimmer, a feeling of sitting along with us in that classroom. We're thrilled to have you here with us today. Take a seat. Welcome. And what it's called is to illuminate the essay. And the essay that we're dealing with is the Declaration of Independence. And what we're going to be doing is examining, as you've already probably looked at the um, online syllabus and the online materials on the presentation page, the historical, political, cultural, economic, and philosophic backgrounds that the Founding Fathers found themselves heir to when they sat down to write the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And so you've all gotten the book, right? Bards at All, American Government and Politics Today, and you've read chapter one, and there was a method to my madness, because if you've read chapter one, you've been introduced to some of the terms such as, in my book it's on page 26, ideas like ideology, institution, legitimacy, liberalism, pluralism, political culture, political socialization, property, a representative democracy, a republic, a theocracy, all these terms you're going to find used in today's lecture. And so by having read the book, hopefully, you'll have at least a nodding acquaintance with some of these terms, and you'll be able to call to mind those definitions as we go forward. Good. So how many people in here have taken English 1A? Okay. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. So uh, this is going to be child's play to you. What we're trying to do then is to take a seminar question and to turn it into a thesis statement, turn it into an outline, turn it into an essay. And this is the essay that's due next week. And so our seminar question is, what were the influences of history, culture, economics, and philosophy on the drafters of the Declaration of Independence? And how can you see those influences reflected in that essay, i.e. the Declaration of Independence, and today's contemporary American political society? And so in each of our presentations, both the online and the in-person, you're going to find a seminar question. For our purposes today, the reading, the lecture, any class discussion that we have is meant to culminate, is meant to find its apex in answering the seminar question. So everything should inform your response to this. For those of you who haven't had 1A or for those of you who need a quick, just a quick refresher, I'd like to go into the process of writing an essay. I know that I often need reminders because my writing style, even though I write quite extensively, can often slide <laughs> pretty quickly if I'm out of practice. And so tips on how to write an excellent essay would be to develop your thesis statement, right? What is your point? To take the seminar question and to recraft it, to re redraft it, to tell your reader what it is that you're going to tell them. To build an outline from that thesis statement, i.e. to build a scaffolding, right? Something upon which your essay is going to hang. And then finally, the structure of your essay, which is to build your edifice, right? To build your essay. What I like to say, if you think of it more uh, well, blithely, is to tell them you're going to tell them and tell them and tell them you told them, right? So tell them you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them you told them. Tell them you're going to tell them is the introduction and your thesis statement. Tell them is the body of your essay, and tell them you told them is to conclude, to restate your thesis statement, to perhaps recraft it, but to restate it and let your reader know what it is that you've just told them so that they can walk away from your essay with a feeling of completion, uh, with a feeling of satisfaction that they've received all the information that you intended to give them. Having said that then, your thesis statement should look something like this, I would argue. The influences of history, culture, economics, and philosophy on the drafters of the Declaration of Independence are evident throughout the work and can still be spotted in contemporary American political society. Right? And so what we've done is we've encapsulated the fullness of the seminar question. What happens is when I'm reading especially the online responses to this essay, we forget that it's a complete question, that I'm not just looking for the history, because people tend to like concentrate on those areas that most interest them. Or perhaps they concentrate on the philosophy. Right? 
to the expense of the other elements. My argument is that it's the universality of these elements that are going to inform our founding generation and that it's a sum total of these influences that are going to be reflected in the Declaration. This is important, especially when we get to the Constitution. So the more work we can do, the more fully we can understand the history, politics, philosophy, economics in the Declaration, all the more better we'll be positioned to understand the Constitution. Right? Because if the in, uh, Declaration of Independence is to be worth its weight in salt, it better be reflected in its entirety in the Constitution. For example, as I'll, as I'll show you, if it says in the Declaration of Independence that people have a right to abolish or alter their systems of government, which is what they're going to be arguing against King George and against Lord North for the independence of these states, then if that's true, that same mechanism better darn well be referenced in the Constitution. Right? You can't hold England's feet to the fire and not hold our own feet to the fire. So this thesis statement then allows us an opportunity in our introductory paragraph to tell the reader what we're going to tell them. And then if I've done my job, we're going to see that the introduction, including the thesis statement, is the tell them you're going to tell them part. And then we're going to tell them, right? And so our thesis statement very clearly delineates distinct aspects, history, culture, economics, philosophy, how they're reflected in the DOI, and how they're reflected in contemporary American political society. So if we have a thesis statement and well-crafted outline, we're not going to forget to mention philosophy. We're not going to give short shrift to culture. Right? These are all equal components of the essay that I'm hoping to find. And so by creating this outline, we remind ourselves, oh, that's right. We have two and a half to three pages to complete this puppy. Right? And this is the complexity, the fullness of what he wants to see. So how do I make sure, because this could be a 14-volume set. This is a huge question if you think about it. So somehow we have to be able to limit, to edit ourselves down to the most important parts. And there is the method to my madness. So you've done this reading, you've done this research, you've listened to the lectures. Now you need to, it's like herding cats, right? Bring it all in and, and put it in two and a half, three succinct pages. And then conclude. You know, people forget that a good conclusion is as important as a good introduction or a good thesis statement. You want to give the reader something to go away with. So then you conclude would be paragraph eight. The seminar question, what were the influences of history, culture, economics, philosophy on the drafters of the Declaration of Independence? So here, if we're examining the historical, cultural, economic, religious, philosophic background to the Declaration of Independence, I would argue that where we want to start with is with the kings and queens of England. So... In order to understand the political landscape the Founding Fathers found themselves in in 1776, we have to consider who they were. We're looking at them with 230 plus years of democracy under our belts and being a democratic republic and having a constitution. We have to remember the stability that we've found, you know, the Civil War and Watergate. And the political divisiveness found in the 2020 election. Understanding the political stability of 230 years informs our understanding of the political world. It just does. We can't imagine the political instability that was extant, that existed in 1776. So in order to understand where they were and what they were writing, we have to get into their heads, yes? We have to understand what their worldview was. Well, the kings and queens of England were a big part of that world. This was their political inheritance. This was their understanding of what politics looked like at the time. Now, we can't start in 1776. My gosh, we would be missing so much. So we have to go back, beyond King George, back beyond the Wars of the Roses. I would argue that we have to go back to Magna Carta, 1215 AD, and King John's defeat at Runnymede at the hands of his rebellious barons. So how many people in here have actually have heard Magna Carta? Yeah, okay, excellent. You guys are way above. And King John? Right, this is King John of Robin Hood fame, right? The younger brother of Richard the Lionhearted. Um, King John is going to be an autocrat. He's going to be throwing his monarchical weight around. He's going to have the mindset of a divine right monarch. And I'll talk about that, define that in a minute. And he is going to be challenged by his barons on the field of battle to share power. Now, here's the deal. Does anybody know the golden rule? Not the one that you find in the Bible, but the other golden rule? So the golden rule in the Bible is love your neighbor as yourself, 
right? The other golden rule is those who have the gold make the rules. And now what we're looking at is the barons vis-a-vis the king, right? Now the king, we know, we think, has complete authority in the kingdom. It's a monarch. It's an autocracy, right? For heaven's sakes, the rule of one, monarch, it's in its definition. But nothing could be further from the truth. If you think about it, especially in 1215, we're talking about an agrarian society. An agrarian society means that the wealth of the land is based in the land. The wealth of the nation, the wealth of the country, is in its agricultural product. Sure, there's trade, there's crafts, there's shipping, there's artisanship. I'm not, with, I'm not suggesting that there isn't, but the true wealth of the land is in agriculture, in farming, in sustenance farming. Now, we're living in a feudal society in 1215, which means that the barons or the aristocracy, the elite, hold land in the name of the king. Everybody's familiar with, with the idea of feudalism, right? And so they are um, loyal to the king. Their fealty is due to the king. But when push comes to shove, it's the king who has to come to the barons in support of any um, nationwide effort such as bearing arms, making war, any foreign aggression. The king's going to have to come to his nobility, to his barons, the guys who own the land, the guys who have the men at arms who are going to be contributed to the king's defense, yes? So whenever the king wants to wage a foreign war or have some kind of cohesive nationwide action, he needs to come to his barons for help. If you were a baron and the king was coming to you time and time again asking you for support, well, asking you for support is kind of generous, taxing you taxing your estates, taxing your income, demanding your fealty through the use of funds, wouldn't you eventually want to participate in the decision-making process? Wouldn't you eventually want some kind of contribution to the discussion? If you're going to be taxed for the king's foreign offenses, don't you want at least some say? For, for um, Magna Carta, though, the idea was that the barons as a group, the 25 barons coming together, are going to challenge the... Uh, autocratic power of the king on the field of battle. They're going to wrest an agreement out of him. It's called Magna Carta, Magna Carta, the, the Great Charter. And Magna Carta is going to set some core constitutional elements in the English system of government. Now, England doesn't have a written constitution as the United States does. What they have is a series of documents, a series of laws and acts and understandings, both formal and informal, that as a body create the English Constitution. And so Magna Carta is going to be a foundational element to that. Now, there's a method to my madness here, because if you look at Magna Carta, what you're talking about is not the Englishman's Bill of Rights, surely. You're not talking about the common Englishman. But you are talking about two important key principles. One by a written grant limiting the autocratic authority of the king so that there's a written understanding that the king's power is not absolute, that there are limitations to it, and two, that these specific understandings are eventually going to filter down to the English common person as the English constitutional history progresses. For example, we're talking about in Magna Carta the birth of the parliament. What you're talking about is a group of barons, these 25 barons, coming together to advise the king. That is going to be the, ins the birth of the institution of parliament. Parliament, roughly, is where we come together to talk, to parley. Right? The place where we talk, the place where we come together. And so originally, these barons, these 25 barons, made up the core of the institution that's going to become parliament, that's going to become the institution that's going to rival the power of the king. Well, that's going to surmount the power of the king, as we'll find with Charles I. We're talking about the standard weights and measures that the king, by virtue of being the apex of government in England, is going to have the authority, the localized sole authority, to set the standards of weights and measures for the country. What is a pound? What is a gallon? What is a liter? Some one person, some one centralized authority is going to need to say, and this is the standard of what is a pound. 
And we're going to find that directly enumerated as a power given to our own U.S. Congress in the Constitution. In future, no official shall place a man on trial upon his own supported statement without producing credible witnesses to the truth of it. So the idea that a person has, a person in our political system, has the constitutional right to face his accusers and to hear the charges against him. These constitutional principles that we have are finding their birth in 2015. No man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. The guarantee of due process that we find in the Constitution, especially in the Bill of Rights, in the first ten amendments to the Constitution, have their birth, again, in 1215 in Magna Carta. I can go on. You can go online. You can pull down a copy of the Magna Carta. It's so available. And it's not very long. Right? It'll take you maybe 10, 12 minutes to read it, honestly. You'll be surprised how many elements in there reflect directly to our own contemporary understanding. So Magna Carta is the cornerstone of liberty and the chief defense against arbitrary rule. Again, it is a series of concessions run on the field of battle, again, from the unwilling hands of King John by his rebel barons, and this is in 1215. It established for the first time a very significant constitutional or written legal principle, namely that the power of the king could be limited by a written grant. So we're starting in 1215, and we're beginning to understand, okay, so 1776, our founding fathers, due process, taking people's property without due process therein, without going through the mechanisms involved to assure justice, to assure uh, that arbitrary rule is limited. 1215, 1776. Taxation without representation, it's directly related. It's directly linked. So, yeah, 1215 is informing our founding generation in their voice in the Declaration. I mentioned the divine right of kings. Now, what we're talking about here is the legitimacy of authority. And your book talks about legitimate authority on page 9, I believe, in chapter 1. Now, it's talking about legitimacy in a constitutional republic, which is what we have, where the, co the legitimacy of authority rests with the people. Now, this is going to be a new concept in 1788 in the writing of the Constitution, yes? The idea of popular sovereignty is going to be brand new. We're going to talk about that. So what was it before? What was the model that the founding generation found themselves with? Divine right of kings. So, if you're looking at a monarchical system, right, or a, a system of kings and queens, or autocracy, where does that legitimate authority come from? And ask yourself, if you're a king, where does your authority come from? Does it come from parliament? No. Parliament exists because you exist. Does it come from the people? Well, you have the people's support, but the people didn't make you king. Where can it possibly come? The divine right of kings is what we're after. Now, when we get to our constitutional system, we're going to shift that, as I'll show you. But we have to understand what these guys were thinking before we can understand what our founding fathers were thinking. So, you're a king. You, come, you become king in one of two ways. One, you're born to a king, right? And you inherit the throne. And so, divine right means that you're a king because God wants you to be king. God is the legitimate authority. God's placing you in a position where you will become king. So it's God's will that's making you a king. Well, this is all fine and well, unless, let's say, you're the second son of a king. And then what happens, as in the case of King Henry VIII, who had an older brother, Arthur, who died before he became king, leaving Henry heir? Was Arthur's death then God's will. Did God want Henry to be king? Well, obviously, unless somebody's talked to God recently, we don't know for sure. But the end shows the means. And the end result is that Henry was king. And if Henry's king, it is God's will. So, yes, Arthur's death must have been God's will. So way number one is to inherit the throne. Way number two, anybody want to guess? War, yeah. You take it by force. Now, here's the deal. If you're challenging a king on the field of battle, you have a, a sanctified, uh, anointed king, somebody who's sitting on the throne 
albeit by God's will, and now you're a rebel upstart, you're a baron perhaps, or you're a claimant to the throne who wants that power, who wants that. If you challenge the king on the field of battle and you win, then obviously God wanted you to be king. Because if God didn't want you to be king, you wouldn't have won, right? And so you assume the throne, you take that legitimate authority. So then is challenging the king on the field of battle legal or is it treason, right? The victors write the history. If you win, then it's legal. If you lose and you're strung up or worse, right, for your treachery, for your treason, then God's will has been triumphant and the king remains seated and the traitors are, are taken off to, the, to their doom. Exactly. Okay, so the divine right of kings is talking about the idea of legitimate authority. And what we're going to be establishing as a constitutional principle in, as we go on with the birth of parliament and the, uh, the rise in parliament's authority, where does legitimacy come from? There's going to be a third way to become king, agreeing to it, parliament putting you forward as the king. But then if we think about it, divine right tells us if God is your boss and God wants you to be in authority, to whom are you accountable? To whom are you responsible for your actions? To God, right? So when your barons challenge you, your response is, I am not responsible to you. I am not accountable to you. I am accountable to God and God alone. So this is going to come into play with we get, when we get to King Charles I uh, and the Stuarts. So the Wars of the Roses, here we go, right? Anybody familiar with this term, the War of the Roses? Okay, so we obviously have a Shakespeare buff in here, yes? Or a history buff. So the Wars of the Roses are two competing branches of the same house, the Plantagenets, right? Those children of Edward who are going to branch into two houses of cousins, and they're going to be competing. Now, let me just, those of you who are riding madly, let me just give you a, a breath here. <laughs> Don't worry about the dates and the names of the kings and, and the reigns, and don't worry about the particulars. Instead, if I may, look at the big picture. My, my thesis here is that people will get power by any means necessary. They will lie. They will cheat. They will steal. They will murder their brothers, their cousins, their aunts, their uncles, their mothers in order to get and keep power. And boy, have we got evidence, right? And this is what the founding fathers were trying to achieve through separating powers, breaking out absolute power into three branches and more. So put down your pens and let's go for a great ride. This is Henry IV, the first king of the House of Lancaster. The House of Lancaster is emblematic of the Red Rose, or the Red Rose is their emblem. The House of Lancaster versus the House of York in the Wars of the Roses, these two branches of the Plantagenets. So Henry deposed his cousin, Richard II, by ordering his death by starvation. He was the first of the House of Lancaster, but he was still a Plantagenet, that overruling house, since both he and the cousin who he killed, again Richard, were grandsons of the same king, Edward III. Henry V was the son of Henry IV, and from his youth demonstrated his abilities as a resourceful and valiant soldier. Now, Henry V is going to be, become a hero in Shakespeare's history plays. Right? And honor, as you suggest, strength, integrity, all those things that you would want in a king, that you would want in a prince. And when we get to the House of York, we'll see the opposite. Moral bankruptcy, decrepitness, slyness, etc. One of the problems with having a valiant soldier king is that they tend to die young. All right? And as does Henry V, Dai Zheng leaving his infant son, Henry VI, as king. Now, one of the beautiful things about our constitutional system is we have regularly scheduled elections. This is what we're dealing with here. We're looking at our candidates. We're looking at their viability. We're going to pick them apart. We're going to look at every inch of their lives, right? This is part of the process in the campaign. Why? Why? Well, our founding generation at the time had this as their inheritance, a nine-month-old inheriting the throne of England. Not very qualified, right? And what's going to happen then when a nine-month-old takes the throne? Power. People will do and say and, and do anything to get power. 
So when you have a power vacuum by virtue of a nine-month-old, watch, watch, watch and learn, Leonard, right? So he came to the throne at nine months old. He was a good man, but a poor king. He was devoted, devoted to education. Um, King's College at Cambridge, for example, was his. Yes, he's going to experience a mental breakdown, which is going to allow his cousin, Richard, the Duke of York, to step in as his protector. What Richard wasn't <laughs> counting on was Margaret, who was Henry the sixth queen, Margaret of Anjou, one of the prizes that he won from his father's participation in wars in France, is going to be, in and of her own right, a very powerful woman. And she's going to be able to get Richard out, right? Richard, the protector, while Henry is checked out, Margaret is going to step in. Well, it's just like Woodrow Wilson. In his last six months in office, he had a stroke. He was debilitated. He was, for the most part, unable to affect his office. I'm not sure how many people realize this. And his wife stepped in and acted as a filter between his, um, uh, the people who were claiming his attention and protecting Woodrow Wilson six months ago in his, in his presidency from being challenged or being ousted. So <laughs> the power behind the throne in this instance is Margaret. Um, but Henry was eventually murdered by his younger brother, another Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, uh, at the Tower of London in 1471 at the urging of another future king, Edward IV. So he's mentally challenged. He's got a strong wife. His cousin is going to step in as protector. He's going to get muscled out. He's going to have another cousin coming in, trying to take his throne and eventually conspire against him to murder him. Lovely family, right? And so this is what we're dealing with when you look at power. And why our founding generation is so careful in developing what we're going to explain as the Madisonian model, the balance of power evidenced in the Constitution, and how power is distributed right, and checked by each other. So Edward IV comes in, and upon the death of his father, he's taken by a, a, a cousin, Richard Neville, to Parliament to be acclaimed king. Oh, wait a minute. This is huge. Wait a minute. This is a watershed moment. He's being taken to Parliament. Remember Parliament from 1215? Right? The birth of Parliament? Well, this is 250 years later, right? And Parliament has had the opportunity to coalesce into an institution in and of its own right and to build power and to build connection and to build place in the English system of government to the point where now, instead of field of battle or inheritance, since there's a question to the claim of the throne, Edward needs a little legitimacy he goes to Parliament, and Parliament proclaims him king. Oh, but wait, 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 wait. What happened to divine right? So with divine right, you're answerable to God. But now, you're being proclaimed king by Parliament. To whom are you accountable? You're beginning to share power. Parliament is now in ascendancy. Parliament is being able to call who's king. And if you can say who is king, logic says you can say who is not king. Or, if a king isn't behaving, challenge him and have the authority to challenge him. So this is huge. And so Edward taking the, the support of Parliament is going to mean that there are going to be strings that are going to come with that. And so he is going to die, leaving his younger brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, as protector of his son and heir, Edward V. Now, this is the same Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who was implicated in the death of Henry VI, the House of York. Ah, we're going to talk about him. But first, we have to get to this poor guy, Edward V, Edward IV's son, who, tradition tells us, is one of the two princes who were murdered, strangled, at the order of his uncle, his protector, Richard of Gloucester, and whose bodies were walled up in the Tower of London in order to hide them from, from the spotlight of inquiry and investigation. So you're a kid's uncle. You're his protector. And instead of protecting him and protecting his claim to the throne, you arrange, you conspire to have them murdered. Again, lovely family. Right? And this is what happens when power comes into play. People will do and say anything to keep in control of power. And so along comes Richard III. Now, what's interesting about Richard III is they just found his bones. You remember this, anybody? It was in the papers. They found him under a parking lot. 
the person who was buried in his coffin in a cathedral close by was actually not him. There was some kind of a switch that they still don't understand, but they found his bones buried in a, in a simple, what was a simple wooden coffin, and they were able to trace his DNA back to, well, descendants, and they were able to prove that they were his bones, and they reburied him in the cathedral. My point is, Richard III was always depicted by Shakespeare as malformed about body and spirit. He comes to the throne, and you have to admit, his legitimacy is a little dicey. Right? I mean, he conspired in the death, the mysterious death, of his young nephews, and all of a sudden now he's king. So he's challenged, again, on the field of battle, and we have a hearkening back then to the idea of divine right, where I mean, the Henry VII, the first Tudor king, successfully challenges Richard III on the field of battle and takes his throne away. So we're going back. Now, this is the thing. Henry, the name Henry, is hearkening back to the great Henrys, Henry IV, Henry V. And so Elizabeth's Tudor claim is going to go back to the Lancastrians by virtue of the Henrys and not to the Yorks. So, so Henry VII, then, is going to be the first modern king. And by that I mean he's the first one to really get or to at least operationalize the necessity to have a strong throne supported by a full purse. The best way to achieve a strong throne is to have the means necessary to affect your will, to operationalize your will without having to go to parliament or go without for your support, right? If they who have the gold make the rules, if you have all the gold, then you get to make all the rules. So Henry the Seventh then is the first modern king, and so he's going to bring power together, and he's going to consolidate power under his throne by virtue of taxes, fees, centralizing the, uh, the fiscal operations of the kingdom under his throne, taking that power away from people who had nibbled away at it over the century. The bottom line is that he's going to leave his son a stable throne by virtue of a full purse. His son, ah, Henry VIII, now, I use this, I know, I know. This, well, I know. Well, so this is the Tudors, and it's showtime. I get it. He holds the sword and a cross. And this is emblematic for who Henry VIII was and why, in 1788, with our First Amendment, our founding generation is going to take great pains to divide church and state and why they got to that, where they, where uh, their history had brought them to want to separate these two. It's this element. So again, we're looking at the history as it's going to inform our founding generation. This guy is huge. Now, so Henry VIII comes into the throne with a full purse that dad left him, yeah? And he goes through it like that, like yep. water, right? Because he's trying to go back and win the lands in France that were lost under the Yorkists. And so this attempt to claim the lands in France is also going to drive his need to have a son. In France, in order to inherit the throne, you have to be a boy. You have to be a male. And so Henry, and it's called the Salic Laws, S-A-L-I-C, Salic Laws in France demand that the heir to the throne be a male. You can't have a woman. And so this is going to drive a lot of what Henry's trying to achieve in his uh, in continuing his dynasty. If Henry has a daughter, as he did with Catherine of Aragon, Mary, Bloody Mary, that's great for England, and Mary can assume the throne in England, but she can't assume the throne in France. If Henry's having pretensions to France, he has to have a son. His uh, field of gold, his, his, his battles in France are to win back the lands that the Lancastrians had won. He needs to have a son. So, Catherine of Aragon is the daughter of the king and queen of Spain, the most Catholic nation in Europe, also the richest, the wealthiest. If you look at the dates, we're looking at 1509 to 1547, we remember the conquistadors. We remember the influx of gold and silver that's coming from the South and Central America. Spain is ridiculously wealthy. It's ridiculously powerful by virtue of this gold coming in, right? England is jealous of Spain's predominance 
What better way, then, for Henry to make his mark on Western civilization than to marry the daughter of the king and queen of Spain, this powerful Catholic nation? Oh, but there's a problem. Yeah, no, no, please. She was his brother's widow. She was his brother's widow. So Arthur, his brother, the Prince of Wales, died before Henry VII died. So Henry VIII becomes the heir to the throne. This is, if you would, like we have William and Harry now, right, over in England. If William were to die, well, now he's got a kid, George, so he would inherit the throne. But pre-George, right, you would have Henry being next in line to the throne. It's the same situation. But, as you suggest, Catherine is Arthur's widow. And so Henry wants to maintain this connection, so he writes to Rome to get permission from the Pope to marry his brother's widow because it's a religious question, right? And so, oh, but darn, wait a minute. He needs the Pope's permission, but the Pope is related to Catherine. Catherine is the niece of the Pope and the aunt to the Holy Roman Emperor, by the way. She's pretty well connected. So while Catherine is a dutiful and loving wife and gives Henry a daughter, Mary, Mary Tudor, later to be called Bloody Mary, Catherine is unable to give Henry the son he desires. So Henry needs to separate himself from Catherine in order to try again with a new wife, in this instance, Anne Boleyn, mother of Elizabeth I. So it's not about falling out of love, nor is it about Henry not being Catholic. Henry is a vehement Catholic. He very strongly believes in Catholic tradition and Catholic teachings. In fact, he wrote an essay in support of the temporal power of the Pope. And he won an award from the Pope. And so all Henry VIII's heirs have that title, Defender of the Faith. It goes back. So Henry needs to separate from the Church of Rome in order to divorce this well-connected Catholic woman. But wait a minute, there's more. Always more, right? <laughs> Money. I said that Henry went through his father's full purse. What happens when you take on the title of the head of the Church of England? You now own all the property of the Church of England. It is yours. It is the thrones. It is at the discretion of the thrones. Yes? So all the endowments, all the orchards, all the vineyards, all the cattle, all the grazing lands, all the monasteries, all the abbeys, all the convents, all the churches, all the gold, all the tapestries, now belong to you. And he's going to go through that too, right? He's going to gather the wealth of the Church of Rome in England and spend it pretty quickly as well. And he's going to marry Anne Boleyn, incest and adultery, um, and is beheaded. Uh, his, Jane Seymour is finally going to give him a son, the son that he wants, Edward. And if I'm not mistaken, the six wives of Henry VIII, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think it's true. Uh, divorce beheaded died, divorce beheaded survived. Right? Yeah. Okay, so um, what you have then is Henry VIII, symbolic of combining the role of the, the temporal power, the military power, the role of the sword, and he now also holds the cross, right, or the spiritual power. So temporal and spiritual power are combined into one person. So that Henry then is driving not only the political world in England, but now also the spiritual world by virtue of his role as head of the Church of England. And so combining those together is a big element in our understanding of the founding generation. Edward VI, his son, is going to come, come to the throne, but he's never actually going to reach majority. He is going to only be on the throne for five years. His realm is going to be governed by a regency council in his name. He's too young to rule. He never reaches majority. He had a genuine concern to help the poor and the needy as well as to promote education and learning. You know, it's rather regrettable that he didn't live. He might have been an interesting monarch, especially following his father, um, Henry. But that being said, off he goes, and we now have Mary. Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Okay, so now we're really looking at the role of religion and what happens when you combine religion and martial authority, right? The cross and the sword. Mary is vehemently Catholic, vehemently Catholic, and she's, she's really angry because her mother, Catherine of Aragon, had been set aside, had been divorced, had been 
humiliated in Mary's eyes. Mary had been delegitimized. Mary had been set aside in favor first of her second, her stepsister Elizabeth, but then eventually her half brother Edward. Mary is also married to Philip II, the King of Spain. He said, "But wait a minute, Mike. Wasn't Catherine of Aragon the daughter of?" Yeah. There's a lot of intermarrying at this point, and Philip II, the King of Spain, and Mary are married, and their job is to bring the Church of England back to the Church of Rome. And by virtue of this, Mary and her husband killed by virtue of religious reasons. So they call her Bloody Mary, but again, remember that the victors write the history. When you look at the actual numbers, her father, Henry VIII, and her half-sister, Elizabeth, actually killed more people by number than Mary, but the Protestant succession, the Protestant victory in England eventually meant that the Protestant religion in England is going to rise, is going to achieve prominence. And so they're looking at writing the history, and they're going to try to make Mary as evil, demonizing, demonizing troublesome, undesirable. dark, undesirable, not to be trusted, because she's Catholic. Ah, so in 1689, we're going to have, I'm going to show you the act of settlement. One of the things that they're finally going to say is that no future monarch of England can be Catholic ever, ever again. And it points back to Elizabeth. Back to the present, right? We have our qualifications for president. You have to be a natural born citizen. Check. You have to be 35. Check. And other than that, there's no qualifications. There is no religious qualification. There's no gender qualification, no race qualification. You have to be an American citizen, and you have to be of a certain age. No religious test is a direct, re, uh, direct result of the 1689 Act of Settlement that says all British monarchs have to be Protestant. Yes. So, Bloody Mary, off she goes. Um, you know, I don't want to give her short trip. She was a troubled person in body and in mind. She was never well. She was uh, herself delegitimized, and so her claim to the throne was kind of rocky to start with. She was uh, in tortured as an individual. As a person, she believed herself to be pregnant. She had hysterical pregnancies. So for years, she thought herself pregnant. She wanted so badly to save England for Roman Catholicism that she believed herself pregnant. And then we have Elizabeth, Gloriana, the second daughter of Henry VIII, and Anne Boleyn, who is going to use her marriage ability in order to attract suitors, attract potential husbands. She would use her marriage ability to form alliances, to attract suitors and to form alliances with that suitor as long as it benefited her. And then when it no longer benefited her, would distance herself and move on to the next. Not to say that she didn't have personal relations. Evidence suggests that she did. She calls, we call her the Virgin Queen because she was never married. She's not unthinking as to who her heir might be. And again, this is one of those great stories of people will do and say anything to keep in control of power. The main claimant to the throne actually has as strong a claim to the throne as Elizabeth is Mary, Queen of Scots, the widow of the King of France, whose son is James VI of Scotland. Problem is, Mary's Catholic. And Mary's going to be implicated in a conspiracy of Catholics using Mary as a standard, you know, a flag, to gather support against Elizabeth and the Protestant throne. So now you have the factions of religion vying for the throne. It's not just individuals. It's the Catholics vying for the throne and the Protestants vying for the throne. You follow? Oh, my stars. Okay, so... Elizabeth has, is faced with this woman who has a good claim to the throne, whose son is the king of Scotland, who has a fairly strong following of Catholics among her subjects. What's a girl to do? Well, you've got to get rid of her. You've got to get rid of her. But wait, her son is the king of Scotland, so how do you stop the king of Scotland from raising arms to come and revenge his mother's death? Well, Elizabeth orders Mary's execution, although she denies it, but we have her signature, but she denies it, right, on the death warrant. 
We also have a letter from Elizabeth to James that doesn't say it outright, but alludes to, you know, you're next in line to the throne, and you're Protestant, which is good, unlike your mother. So just remember that you're heir to the throne, James, and when I die, you're next. And so when Mary is executed, James does come down with his soldiers and his halyards and his swords and gets to the border and rattles them really, really loud and yells really loud and real mad and then turns around and goes home. A son standing by and watching his mother beheaded goes unrevenged because the son knows that if he plays, he's next. There's another element. It's called interdict. Now, what we're dealing with is using a religious tool to achieve a political end. And again, we're going back to our founding generations and the first amendment that we're going to talk about. Why did they take such pains to separate church and state? Why is it such a huge issue? It's rhetorical. In order to understand um, why it was so important to the founding generation, we have to get what the history was. So here's how. The Pope said, as long as that woman, Elizabeth, is on the throne, I'm imposing interdict over England, which means that as long as she's on the throne, if you're Catholic in England, there are going to be no sacraments. I refuse to allow sacraments to be had in England. And if my mother will kill me. So baptism, uh, Eucharist, confirmation, marriage, Holy orders, uh, becoming a priest, extreme unction, and reconciliation. Did I get them all? Pretty close. So if you're a Catholic in England and interdict is imposed, it means that if you have a child, that child can't be baptized. If that child dies, it goes to purgatory. It can't go to heaven. Your marriage is sanctified in the eyes of God. If you die with a mortal sin on your soul, there is no reconciliation. You go to hell. Sorry. Extreme unction, the blessing of the sick in the end, right? That, that final sacrament, no good. No further priests. Sacraments are kiboshed until that woman, he had more choice words than I, is off the throne. In other words, what the Pope is saying, that anything you need to do to get her off the throne is okay, up to and including murder. Get her off the throne. We need a, we need a Catholic on the throne of England. So what he's doing is he's using a spiritual tool, the sacraments, to achieve a political end, inciting the Catholics in England to rise up against the monarch and to replace her with a Catholic. Whew. Wow, this is huge. <laughs> I'd like to tie a string around your finger. Do you ever hear that? Okay, just to remind you very quickly that it's at this time that Thomas Hobbes is writing, as being born, forgive me, 1588, when Elizabeth is queen, and Philip II is spending, sending a Spanish armada over the channel to take back the throne of England for, for Catholics, right? And it's going to be distributed by a storm, destroyed by a storm. Thomas Hobbes is writing, and he's going to be one of our main political philosophers that are going to inform our studies today. And so I just wanted to place him in context, historical context. 1588, Philip II, Elizabeth, all this stuff's happening when this guy is Stuart England. So Elizabeth's the last tutor, no heirs, right? So the next house that's in line for the throne is, as I suggest, James, Mary, Queen of Scots' son. And he's going to come to the throne in 1603 on Elizabeth's death. First thing he's going to do, he's going to bury Elizabeth and, his, and Mary together. Mary, Bloody Mary. Elizabeth and Mary Tudor share a tomb. Has anybody been to Westminster? Paul, uh, Westminster, no. Yeah, it was Mr. Abbey. He made a, a nice but small throne where he combined Mary and Elizabeth in a chapel to the side that, he, that are also buried with the princes that were walled up in the tower and a couple of other less nobles or smaller nobles who had no issue who had no kids. And so what James is going to do is he's going to slam, insult, both Mary and Elizabeth for their infertility by placing them in a chapel reserved for people who are infertile. 
And he's going to make a tomb for his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, in the opposite chapel on Westminster Abbey. And he's going to make it huge. Right? And so this is his. 1903. Comes down, takes the throne of England. The um, parliament is suspicious of him. He's got some great ideas, but not a lot of money. They're worried that they, he's going to establish Presbyterianism, which is Church of Scotland, as opposed to Anglican faith, which is Church of England, to no avail. Um, he was pretty well anglicized by that time. Uh, there's a lot of stories that I can tell you about James. Uh, James I is the first James of England, the sixth of Scotland, so he goes by James I when you're talking about his role as the king of England. Charles I is a throwback to the divine right monarch. How he proves this or how he shows this is by his disinclination to call parliament together. If the king really only needs to call parliament when he needs money, if the king has enough money he doesn't need to call parliament, parliament then is dissolved until the king says so, until the king calls them into existence. But when you have an organization, an institution that's used to being in existence and now all of a sudden it's not for years, and years, they begin to get jealous of their authority. They get jealous of their position. And so the king is seen as limiting them, limiting their authority, not calling them into session, because they only breathe when he says so, right? They only exist by virtue of his permission. Well, eventually he has to call them in. Eventually he needs money. And finally he calls them in, and they say, okay, great, well, here we are, and now that we're here, Charles, we have some things we want to talk to you about. We want to talk to you about this. He says, never mind. They call it the short parliament. They called him in. They started uh, making their claims. He dissolved them. Never mind. Never mind. Now, parliament isn't going to stand for this. Parliament is being headed up by a faction of Puritans. Puritanism is a sect of Protestantism. Charles I stands up to parliament and parliament's rights. Parliament, under this Puritan new model, says, we're not going to stand for it, and they actually raise an army in answer to the king's refusal to call them into session. And so they're going to demand that the king call them into session a la Runnymede, King John, Magna Carta. They're going to make war against the king. And so the Protestant, or forgive me, the Puritan's army is called the New Model Army. They're also called the Roundheads. This is a great way to remember them, because remember, they're not into vanity. They're not into music, not into dancing, not into drinking, the pleasures of the world, and vanity is surely one of the worst, right? And so they're called the roundheads, because any hairstyle, any fancy hairstyle is seen as vanity. And so they would put a bowl on your head and cut away anything that wasn't bowl, right? And that's where this... this this hairstyle came in, this Puritan hairstyle, it would, they were called the roundheads because everybody had the same haircut. That's where it comes from. It's amazing how these things come into our vernacular, right? And the king's army were called the cavaliers, the royalists, the loyalists. So they fight. It's a civil war. And the roundheads, the Puritans, the parliament wins. Okay. Now here's the problem. The king is the personification of sovereignty. In a monarchical system, the king is sovereign. Sovereignty is having within you all the political power, all political power. So in a republic, as we have, sovereignty rests with the people. This is evidenced in our constitution in that within seven years, every individual elected official can be out on their ears, can be out of office within seven years. We, in a constitutional republic, are sovereign. In a monarchy, the actual physical person of the king is sovereign. So during the coronation ceremony, when the king is crowned, right, that's only the outward sign of another ceremony that's already happened, which is the anointing. And so when you look at film strips of Elizabeth II's coronation or her father George VI's coronation, you're going to find they don't show the anointing of, with oil. This is a hearkening back to the Old Testament sanctification like a priest, because you're becoming a priest. They argue that the anointing with oil is such a sacred part of the coronation ceremony that it defames it by televising it. 
It's too sacred for common eyes. So the coronation is only an outward symbol of a, another ceremony that's already happened. And it's in that ceremony that the person, the actual physical human being, right, is made sovereign. President and Michelle Obama went over to visit the Queen. You may remember this a few years ago. And Michelle Obama, I mean, this, the Queen's like this high, right? She's like 80 years old. She's a sweet little old lady. And so Michelle Obama kind of patted her on the shoulder, right? Exactly. And, you know, the, the, the uproar, well, they love drama, right? But you don't touch the queen. She's the personification of sovereignty. That's unthinkable that you would actually touch the queen. It's so familiar. There's a method to my madness. So Charles I loses the battle. And he's brought to trial. This is the chair. Right? And so imagine Charles I is sitting there. And he's being tried by the victorious New Model Army, the victorious Parliament. Oliver Cromwell and his, and his lynchmen. Right? So here we are, Oliver Cromwell and his lynchmen. And the king sits there, and he's being, they're demanding answers from him right? in response to an accusation of treason. He made war against his people. They're accusing him of treason. Answer yourself. Well, the poor guy's sitting there, and as the personification of sovereignty, he can't answer. If he answers, it's tantamount to acknowledging the authority of these accusers to bring him to trial. So he has no choice as divine right monarch but to sit there and to not answer. If he speaks, if he responds, he acknowledges their authority to question him. They have no authority to question him. And so the poor SOB sits there, silent. He has no choice. Unsurprisingly, they find him guilty of treason, and they behead him. Charles I, King of England, is actually beheaded for bringing treason against his people. Parliament wins. We go from 1215, where... The 25 barons demand some kind of shower, power sharing with King John to Edward, where Parliament acclaims him king. Now Parliament is ascended. Parliament is greater than the king. Parliament is able to take the life of the king. You follow? But Oliver Cromwell comes to the power for nine years. He refuses to be crowned king. This is a Puritan effort. This is the Puritans, a religious sect, taking over government. For nine years, it worked, as long as Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, was Lord Protector, because he had that strength of personality that was, was able to pull it off. And he was able to politically keep um, the opposition at bay. When Cromwell dies, he's buried in Westminster Abbey, and his son, Richard Cromwell, comes to the power. You know the old nursery rhyme, hickory dickory dock, mouse ran up the clock? This is it. This is it. This is a nursery rhyme about Richard Cromwell. Dick is short for Richard, yes? Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. He came into power. The clock struck one, one year. The mouse ran down. He's out of here. He's going to live in France, right? He's uh, going to acknowledge that his father had the personal oomph to hold the coalition together, this Puritan coalition, Richard didn't have it. And so it crumbled around him, and he scampered. He eventually came to live and die in England under an assumed name in the end. So Parliament realizes this isn't going to work. The Puritan model, this Puritan governance, is being rejected right, by other competing forces in the kingdom. The only way to achieve... A strong England is to have a strong monarch, to hold these coalitions to account. They need a monarch, Thomas Hobbes. Remember him? String around your finger? He's going to write, and I'm going to show you, Leviathan. What happens in the absence of a strong centralized authority? When you don't have the authority to keep people in check, people will devolve to a state of nature, and it will be a war of every man against every man. This is what's happening under Richard Cromwell's protectorship. 
So they invite the son of Charles I to come and take the throne, Charles II. So the first thing Charles II is going to do is take revenge on those Puritans that killed his father. So we think, why did the Puritans seek religious asylum in the colonies? <laughs> Hello. Right? It wasn't because they were Puritans, necessarily. It was because of what the Puritans had done politically. All right? So it's a great story, but there's more to it than that, more to it than seeking religious freedom. Charles II comes to the throne, and he reestablishes the authority of the throne in light of a parliament that has been humbled. James II, the Duke of York, is the Duke of York that New York is named after. He comes to the throne, and true, his wife is Catholic, his children are Catholic, but Parliament is aware that he is a weaker monarch than his older brother, and they're able to begin throwing their weight around a little bit more. They see themselves ascendant again, and they take advantage of his weakness to disinvite him from the throne of England, so depending on which side of the fence you're on, whether you're parliament or the king, from the king's perspective, he was dethroned. From parliament's perspective, he abandoned his throne. The bottom line is they got him to the coast with swords behind him and encouraged him to keep going. And so he lived in France for the rest of his life, and the throne of England once again was vacant. But now, my friends, parliament's finally getting smart. They're going to create what's known as the 1689 Act of Settlement. Now, 1689 is less than 100 years from our own Constitution in 1788. So, again, if you're looking at the founding generation and the influences of history, this Act of Settlement is huge. Before they invite the next king and queen, Mary and William, to take the throne, they got a little something for them to sign. What is the role of Parliament in England? What is the role of the king? What are the fences around the king's authority and around Parliament's authority? What can the king do? What can they not? One thing is that the king always must be Catholic, uh, Protestant. We will no longer have a Catholic king, ever, 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 according to the 1689 Act of Settlement. In its Philosophy will be talking about the role of the president as both head of state and head of government. So bringing those two roles back together in one person. But the 1689 Act of Settlement finally divides it so that the king is no longer political. The king is a head of state. You want an example? The Queen of England, to this day, opens parliament. She rides in the Irish state coach. She wears you know, the state crown and all her full regalia. It's a beautiful, beautiful ceremony. Pomp and circumstance coming out your ears. She sits on her throne and um, she opens parliament by reading a speech. The speech is to direct her ministers, her government, being run in her name by her authority, right, to govern England, to, to govern England for the next year. The speech that she reads is given to her by her parliament, by her prime minister. Apart from the advise and warn function of the monarch in this constitutional system, she can't so much as change a word of the speech that she's been given to read. So she's reading a speech to open her government, her parliament, in her name, and she can't so much as change a word of the speech that she's been given. This is the 1689 Act of Settlement. This is dividing the role of the king as head of state and head of government. According to this constitutional theory, Powers can be divided in a written form. Brilliant. So this is the historical influence on our founding generation. So when we look at the Madisonian model and we examine very clearly the distinctions between the president's authority and congressional authority, right, we'll see how it relates directly back to this agreement. Excellent. So there's, there is a method to my madness after all, yes? And uses her authority as head of state to create diplomatic ties within and amongst the crown heads of Europe, but she dies airless, bringing us quickly to the head of Arian. George I, George II, George III, George IV. The head of Arians. 1689 Act of Settlement, number one, you can't have a Catholic. So 
Anne dies, Queen Anne dies, and you have 65 claimants to the throne. Any idea why they don't qualify? Anybody? They're Catholic, right? 65 Catholics in line to the throne before George the first. Problem is, they're all Catholic, so they're disqualified. Sophia, Electress of Hanover, is the next person who's in line, who's Protestant. She's an old gal. She says, you know, I'll defer. I'll defer to my son, who would be next, George. George is a prince of Hanover. He's German, German through and through. And so when he comes over to England, he's going to bring his German court. He's going to bring his German wife, his German courtiers, his German musician, Handel. Right? Well, Handel was already here, but he's going to re-employ Handel. His German mistresses, his German food. Dude's German. He's the only king of England who's not buried in England. He's buried back in Hanover. He couldn't even stand to be buried there. Not so much with England, right? And so his son, George II, is much like fathers and sons are historically want to, is a rival, right? So George II is rivaling his father. He's going to show his father up by being as English as his father isn't. And so George II then is going to strive mightily to create an English court, be all things English, which is great. And he's also going to reign during a period of colonial expansion, vast colonial expansion of the English system because Spain, France, the Netherlands are all expanding as well, and especially in North America and South America. And so George is going to head up a period of great colonial expansion. He's also going to oversee, in name, the French and Indian Wars. Remember, England is always at war with France, pretty much historically, down through the ages. And so there's the Hundred Years' War going on. There is um, Spain involved to some extent, but England and France are warring. But now they're taking that fight that's going on in Europe, and it's going to start going on in North America because you have the French colonies up north, you have the English colonies down south, right? And so the, the beef that's going on in Europe is going to find traction in North America where the French colonies are going to make war on the English colonies and the French are going to invite the Indians, right, the Native Americans, to join them in their battle against the English. So this is the French and Indian Wars. These are the wars that are going to cause the taxes that the founding generation aren't going to be represented in the discussion of, that's going to compel them to the Declaration of Independence. So there's actually a method to my madness. So it depends on which side you're looking at these wars on. If you're looking at it from British Parliament's perspective, they're protecting the English colonies from the French and from the Indians. And so since by protecting the English colonies, the English colonies should be expected to pony up. They should be expected to help pay for their own protection. If you look at it from the colonials experience, they in Europe are having this war. Their war is spilling on us over here. They need to pay for it. We shouldn't have to pay for their war being transmitted over here. Forget that. The problem is, though, that the colonists weren't included in the discussions in Parliament that led to the taxes. All happening during the reign of George II, George III. Finally, the king who's alive and to whom the Declaration of Independence is directed. Right? George III is going to be the monarch, as we're going to see, who gets slammed in the Declaration. Fine. So George III is known to a great extent by his um, uh, mental instability caused by a genetic issue that caused him to check out mentally, in and out over the years. His son, George IV, is going to step in as his regent when he's checked out. So George IV is going to become uh, politically involved in the discussions as well. But Lord North, to introduce another guy, Lord North is the prime minister. He's the head of parliament. He's the one who's going to drive most of the tax questions to pay for the French and Indian wars that are being conducted in George II's name. And George III is going to sign on to those taxes. He's going to agree with those taxes. But we know it's just in an advice and warning sense. It's actually Lord North's government, the parliament, who has the actual authority. And so just to bring this up, then this is George IV, the regent, right, during his father's <laughs> illness. William IV, Victoria, 
Edward VII, her son, George V, Sailor Bill, his son, and this is Edward VIII, the one who advocated, advocated to marry Wallace Simpson, his younger brother, the Duke of York, King George VI, this is the King's Speech, George, who is Elizabeth's father, who is the current queen, her son, Chuck, Charles, and his son, uh, William, and now he and Kate, right, just had a baby named George. So wow, 1215 to present, and probably long after I'm off the planet, right? My little kid will live for a while, I'm sure. So, that is the historic background. This is paragraph two, right? One paragraph in your essay. What were the key elements that we just talked about for the last hour? What were some of the key elements? Challenge of power. Challenge of power. Balance of power. Grab of authority. Grab of authority. Grab of authority. Grabbing authority. Grabbing authority. Grabbing authority. The order of power. The order of power? Oh, how power has changed. OK, great. The evolution of power, perhaps? OK. Religion versus politics. Religion versus politics, religion versus state. What happens when, when the sword and the cross are held in the same hands? What else? Divine right. Divine right. Divine right. The idea of divine right and the source of authority, the source of legitimate authority. Excellent. What else? The Settlement Act. Okay. <laughs> Lying and murdering and stealing and cheating and walling up princes in the home. In the walls of the Tower of London? Settlement the Act. The Settlement Act, right? Becoming, having a constitutional agreement, a written agreement that separates and balances thereto by mm, competing authorities, competing institutions. Excellent. What about spin? What about Shakespeare? What did we learn from that? They even have, they even have the goal to make the rules, but the victors write the history, right? If you look at, for example, the New Deal and FDR, and you read uh, contemporary accounts of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the New Deal bringing the country out of the Depression, the victors write the history. Had you look at it from Franklin Roosevelt not winning, not taking the reins of power in the Depression, our view of the New Deal legislation might have been completely different. Because they won, they wrote the history behind it. So paragraph one you're introducing with your thesis statement. Paragraph two is the history. You, you've given me five different elements, right? So what I would expect is perhaps not a laundry list, but alluding to the complexity. It's not that simple, right? We're talking about a very complex question, the historical influences of the founding generation. And then pick one, 1689, the evolution of power, uh, the settlement act, oh my goodness, pick one, and maybe with two or three sentences, because we're talking about a paragraph, right? go into a little more detail. You can see, then, that editing is the key. Good, strong editing is the key to achieve a really concise two and a half, three page essay, because we've only just begun. And we look at what our culture is, or how we look at the world. I would argue, if I may, just very quickly, that a big part of our culture is a sense of individualism. The role of the individual. We have a very individualistic society. Individualism is the starting off place. We are individuals contributing to a collective. This is significantly different. If this were my comparative ideologies class, we would talk about socialism or the idea that the group has predominance as opposed to the individual. But because we're in this um, um, classic liberal society, classic liberalism is a philosophy that was extant in 1788, uh, we are individuals first and a group later. What else can you tell me about this culture? What do we think about communication? We expect communication to be instantaneous, right? We expect to have access. We expect to have correctness in reporting. We expect to have our leaders accountable to us, right? That is part of our culture. What about fairness? We expect to be treated fairly, right? I just you know, had a student who was you know, talking about needing perhaps an exception or needing um, uh, to talk about the, the structure of the class and the timing of the class. My response is, I need to be fair. Right? What I offer to one student, I have to offer to all students. That's just fairness. Right? So we have this, this mindset that it must be fair. Now, we know that the world's not fair. 
We know that exceptions are made. We know it's maddening, right? When we see people get off, you know, they can afford a good lawyer. They get, seemingly, they get off, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. But why that rankles is because we have an expectation of fairness. So that's part of our culture, right? So if we were to write the Constitution today, if we were to write a system of government, that Constitution would be reflective of our culture at the time. We would see individualism in there. We would see fairness in there because it's what we view the world to be. Yes? Right? 1788, 1776, what is the culture at the time? How is their culture evidenced in the Declaration of Independence? Humanism, manifest destiny, republicanism, and Protestant work ethic. Humanism. Humanism is the idea coming from the Age of Enlightenment. So the Age of Enlightenment is the sum total of the philosophy at the time of Voltaire and Rousseau and Montesquieu, right? To some extent Hobbes, this rejection of assuming that inherited authority is correct. So just because something has always been true doesn't mean that it always has to be true. It's the birth of scientific inquiry. It's the birth of examining more closely those inherited truths that we've lived by forever. For example, there is drought. There is disease. There is starvation and deprivation. Inherited authority prior to the Age of Enlightenment would tell us to pray for a relief from drought, to pray for a relief from pestilence. Humanism isn't a rejection of religion. I would argue that humanism, as in deism, and I'll talk about deism with Jefferson in a moment, is the idea that God gave us the inherent creativity, the inherent intelligence to correct our own ills. So instead of just praying for relief from drought, build a dam. Build irrigation systems. Instead of just praying for relief from pestilence, find out what causes the pestilence. Perform some scientific inquiry and realize that it's the fleas on the rats that are causing the plague. And get rid of the rats, you get rid of the plague. You follow? Humanism, in a nutshell, is that we can fix most of the ills that mankind is heir to just by virtue of our intelligence, hard work, and inquiry. Now, translate that to political thought. We've always had a monarchy. Monarchy is messed up. Nine-month-old babies, people vying for power, walling kids up, bloodshed, lying, chicanery. This is what we've always had. If you take the idea of cultural humanism, this idea that we can fix our ills, and apply that now to our political discourse, oh my stars, the world opens up. What would the world look like if we didn't have a monarchy? What other models are there? We can paint castles in the sky. Go ahead, throw it open. Think about it freely. What would we have in place of a monarchy? What other systems could we possibly enjoy? And let's give it a shot. Let's try it. What the hell? What the heck, right? Okay, good. So humanism is imbuing the culture and it's being applied to the political system. Manifest destiny. You've heard this in high school, right? And really it refers to the 1800s, in the mid-1800s when we were looking west, right? We as a nation were looking west, and we saw this great expanse of uncharted territory, uninhabited, Native Americans notwithstanding, uninhabited territory that we could march into and bring the blessings of civilization and enlightenment, right? Manifest destiny. You've heard this in high school. You know what I'm talking about, right? This isn't just the 1800s. This was extant in 1788 and 1776 as well. You're, you have your colonists clinging to the edge, precariously to the edge of the North American continent. Check. But that's not stopping them from looking westward and saying, mine, mine. Here's how. Look at the borders of Pennsylvania during the colonial period. It, there are two lines, you know, it kind of starts with New Jersey, right, with Philadelphia, right, and it goes west. And if you look at the original drawings, there's two parallel lines that go from Philadelphia and go west and just keep going. They don't even know what the heck's out there, but it's ours, right? 
In Ohio, for example, Case Western Reserve University, they call it Western Reserve because it was originally part of Pennsylvania. It hadn't even really been explored yet. It had been claimed for Pennsylvania. It was the Western Reserve. Now it's Ohio. Who knew? But this idea of manifest destiny is a cultural embodiment of the idea that there is nothing stopping us. This is ours. This is our destiny. It is our God-given right. It is our birthright. It is ours. And we just need to take it. It's our destiny made manifest. Republicanism. This isn't Republican Democrat. Clear that from your mind. This is Republicanism as described in your book, which is why it's so important to do our reading, right? Republicanism is sovereignty resting with the people. There is no sovereign authority. There is no king. There's king in name, but really think about the colonial experience. So you come over Massachusetts, for example, right? You have these charters. The charters are from the king, but they give you the right to create a system of self-governance as you see fit, originally. And so these people come over from England, right? And they're settling in these areas, and they're deriving their own government from the models that they have available. What are the models that they have available? Well, this is so interesting in that the English system of local parish government got transferred to the colonies, which allowed a large measure of local autonomy and then translated to strong local structures that then became the U.S. legal system based on what is effectively the English common law, a structure based on a monarch, commons, and lords, and a philosophy of controls on authority and the rule of law. It's no coincidence that the most successful ex-colonies in the New World are the U.S., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Of course, this is based ultimately on the English experience. For instance, all land up to the Elizabethan period was farmed in common a structure that comes from the Anglo-Saxons and still continued under the Norman conquest. Total, some total of the people of the church get together, right, or the town get together and for themselves define what their laws are going to be and then have an alderman, have, a, have an elder, have some kind of a, an executive to execute the will of the people, right? So you're going from the late 1600s then to 1776, 1788, and you have 200 years of the evolution of this idea that we, the people, own the right to direct our own affairs. Republicanism. Sovereignty rests with the people. The king's 3,000 miles and three months perilous sea journey away. We're making our own rules. 200 years of evolution of this idea is going to imbue the culture. Think about it. 200 years of we drive our own lives, we make our own decisions, is, it's going to become part of your zeitgeist. It's going to be part of your collective consciousness. You're not even going to think about it. Of course we drive our own affairs. We always have. We always will. Yes? Ah. Until the king decides otherwise, right? With the intolerable acts coming up. Protestant work ethic. You want an example of Protestant work ethic? You guys are here. It's Saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's a beautiful summer day, right? It's still August. It's beautiful out there, yes? yes. And you guys are sitting in here listening to me, uh, right? You guys are sitting in here listening to me. What does this say? You guys are awesome, for one thing, but this is the Protestant work ethic. If you want to get ahead... If you want to improve yourself, if you want a degree, if you want to get a better life, whatever that means, whether it's more education or the money that comes from more education, okay, right? You're doing it. You're taking that extra step. You're taking personal responsibility, individual responsibility, to improve your stake in life. Yes? Yes? This is it. Now, the Protestant work ethic is alive and well in 1788 and 1776. Alive and huge because the Protestant idea is pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, individualism, individual responsibility, individual rights. And so individualism, we guide our own affairs. This land is ours going out to there. We don't even know it's out there, but damn it, it's ours. And we can cure all our ills just by taking our way out of a paper bag. Humanism, manifest destiny, republicanism, Protestant work ethic combined to create the culture in 1776. Imagine living at that time. Wow. 
What an explosive era. No wonder that the founding generation was able to bring together such a collection of minds in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention. Huge. My caveat. These weren't all Englishmen. The ethnic makeup at the time tells us there were also Dutch, Germans, Irish, Scotch, French, and my personal favorite, the Scotch-Irish. So this idea that they were, these were loyal Englishmen is true, but only to an extent. Benjamin Franklin, one of the main leading lights of the age of enlightenment thinking, himself said, quote, there are so many Germans coming, we are in danger of them Germanizing us as opposed to us anglicizing them. So even Benjamin Franklin was afraid of the influence of a strong current of immigrants, in this instance from Germany, and the impact on the culture at the time. Immigration and this, this melting pot goes back to our founding generation. And so the ethnic makeup at the time helps imbue the culture. Here's how. The Scotch-Irish, you know Dolly Parton? Dolly Parton, right? You know that lovely little accent she has? You just want to like love her to death, right? That cute little accent? She gets that from her ancestry. That is the Scotch-Irish Appalachian roots that she's coming from. Here's how. The Scotch-Irish, when they came over, were seen as less than. They were the outcasts. They were the outsiders, them. And they were pushed out of the population areas to the frontiers. They weren't accepted in the towns. They were pushed out. And at the time, the frontiers were the Appalachian Mountains. And so the Scotch-Irish were pushed to farm the Appalachian Mountains, this rough, um, hard, grapple, hardly arable land, right? And forced to inhabit that and cultivate that. And they stayed there. And they raised and they evolved. And so you still can hear the Scotch-Irish accent through Dolly Parton's lips. It's amazing. Why? Does this relate? The ethnic makeup is going to help drive the culture, and the culture is going to drive the ethnic makeup. How people contribute, what they contribute, is going to be a part, of, part and parcel. Paragraph three, culture. So, not a laundry list, surely, but I would expect that in your paragraph you would allude to these important key elements, and then pick one. Pick your favorite. Maybe not do a lot of little extra research. We're talking about a paragraph, two or three paragraphs, you know? But a good definition or a little extra reading, both within your book, right, will help drive your paragraph. So tell me about the culture at the time. Prosperity in the colonies rested in agriculture. It was an agrarian society. There was also crafts and trade. There was commerce in whiskey, rum, shipbuilding, trade in hides, fishing, iron, surely... But they were talking about an agrarian society. Now, one of the problems with an agrarian society, if you're going to achieve wealth, is that you want to expand your arable land, right? You need to expand your farming land. The farther you expand, the further you get away from the population areas. Yes? Right? And so the further you get away from the population areas, the harder it's going to be to get your product to market, which is why corn mash, whiskey is going to become so important. Instead of carrying a bushel of corn, you can create whiskey out of that bushel, and the whiskey is much more portable. It's much more easily got to market. So farming in arable land is going to be dependent on the infrastructure available to get your goods to market. The further you expand away from the markets, the more you need infrastructure to help you, roads, waterways, right? Problem is, without a strong collective effort, usually through a government, that infrastructure is not going to happen. Why would we build a road 15 miles out to Mike's property so that Mike can get his goods to market? Let Mike do that, right? But Mike doesn't have the means to build a road. Why doesn't Mike? Well, take out a loan. All banking is in England. There are no banks in the colonies. There is no way to achieve an investment in the local infrastructure by individuals. You have to go through England. It's one of the ways England kept control of the market and of the economy through banking. In an agrarian society, this is the death knell, because you can only expand so far then. 
And so it's being strangled. So the response is going to be in the Articles of Confederation and under the Constitution, the existence of banking and the government control of creating post offices and post roads and the mechanism of creating infrastructure to expand the economy. But all this being said, our founding generation was pretty well off. The median income for white colonists at the time was as high, if not higher, than that of their European counterparts. Now, one of the things the European counterparts had was participation in the parliamentary system so that even if the government wasn't going to help us achieve infrastructure, at least they weren't taxing us. At least they weren't taking our property. At least they weren't hammering us and taking our property away from us. Until... Those French and Indian Wars, Lord North, George II, George III, ah, there was a reason for all my hammering. The Stamp Act of 1765 meant to pay for, in part, the defense of the colonies against the French. Now, the stamp isn't a stamp like a postage stamp. That's not what this is. Have you ever seen a legal document that has embossment, right? One of those stamps that raises, right? That's the stamp. The stamp back paper was, I, I know because I've actually, there's only two pieces left in the world of stamp back, pa stamp back paper, and I've actually held one in my grimy little paws. It's very cool, uh, but it's, it's, it's an embossment. It's a raised lettering. Uh, and what it was meant to do was to tax those people most able to pay for the tax. So if you had a legal document, and I'm thinking a contract, I'm thinking a marriage license, I'm thinking... Legal documents, wills, um, trusts, mortgages, anything like that, in order for it to be legal, it had to be printed on stamp act paper, which meant those people who were most able to pay the tax, people who were performing legal functions, pay the tax, right? Be by buying the paper that it needed to be put on. But then it was expanded. They needed more money. And this is where they got into trouble. And they expanded it to include newspapers, pamphlets, any kind of bills of lading or any kind of trade documentation, right? Bills of lading for um, the cargo of a ship, for example. So what Lord North's government did, if you think about it, it's really not wise. They taxed those people who are most likely to pay, most able to pay, but those people who you really don't want to or make mad at you. Like, the people who print the newspapers, journalists, you don't want them mad at you. Pamphlets, which are like newspapers, more like magazines, right? But they're broadsides, like these things. It would be broadsides or pamphlets, things that come out for political reasons. You don't want them mad at you. Legal documents, you don't want the lawyers mad at you. Commercial bills, the merchants, advertisements, more merchants. These are the people who are going to rail against the Stamp Act. And they're going to get the population on their side because they're going to have to pass the cost of this tax off to them. So this is where the term getting ridden out of town on a rail comes from. Have you ever heard that term? Mm -hmm. Okay, so anybody familiar with what actually happens? No. That's, okay. So they hog tie you. They tie your wrists and they tie your ankles, right? And then they hang you from a two-by-four, right? A piece of wood, a long piece of wood, and they hang you from it and they put you on and you're ridden out of town on a rail. That's what they did to the Stamp Act officers. It was such a rebellion, it was such a popular support against the Stamp Act that the governor of Massachusetts at the time wrote Parliament, wrote the king, and said, I'm unable to maintain control of the, con of the colony. I'm unable to maintain control because the Stamp Act is so onerous, the groundswell of support against it is so strong that it's actually hampering my ability to maintain authority. So they did away with the Stamp Act, not because of the rebellion, but because of the governor's fear that the rebellion would turn into more uh, uncontrollable chaos. So they did away with the Stamp Act, and instead they had the Townsend Acts. Okay, so this places a tax on commodities. So this is a much broader tax. It's meant to be more egalitarian. It's, most, it's meant to be a sought to those people who were angry about the Stamp Act. It was meant to smooth ruffled feathers. It wasn't meant to be 
a punishment yet. But remember when we said taxation without representation? This isn't just hyperbole. I always thought it was. I always thought it was like folklore, much like you know the Puritans seeking um, religious freedom. I thought, hmm, maybe this is one of those. So I went back east and I did original research with newspapers at the time, and it really was about taxation without representation. It wasn't the taxation that they were mad at. It was the fact that they weren't represented in the conversation. They weren't represented in Parliament. It's quite true. Now, for example, the tea. When you look at the tea and the tax imposed on the tea, it actually benefited, believe it or not, the colonists. The colonists had been smuggling in tea. The tea that they were getting from the East India Tea Company was better quality, and the tax was almost nominal. It was, it was barely a tax at all. It was the imposition of the monopoly that really them off, that really got them mad. The East India Tea Company had a charter from the crown, and it had a monopoly so that the East India Tea Company that was in economic trouble would survive so that they could continue to pay fees and duties to the crown. The crown wanted to see the East India Tea Company survive so that it could continue to pay money. In order to achieve that, they established a monopoly so that those in the colonies could only buy tea from these guys. That's what it's not. And so the Boston Tea Party, now it happened in Boston, but there were also rumblings in New Jersey and New York, but they didn't get the traction that it did in Boston. 150 men in 10 parties of 15 broke down to board ships in Boston Harbor, we know this story, right, and dumped the tea over the side. And so news got back to England earlier the next year in 1774, and the reaction was anger, anger from the British Parliament, anger from the king, and so the government proposed instill a series of legislation meant to punish Boston. So these were punitive. These were called the Intolerable Acts, if you're asking the colonists, or the Coercive Acts, if you're asking England. So England is trying to coerce Boston, Massachusetts in particular, into submission, into playing fair, adhering to rules, adhering to the British policy. Coerce it, to coerce them into action. Colonists called them the intolerable acts because they were intolerable and they were meant to punish. Here they are, just very quickly. So we're looking at the economic background and the taxes and the Boston Tea Party are elements, but the coercive acts are elements as well because they tend to be economic. First, there was a blockade, the Boston Port Act, which closed the Port of Boston. So they closed the Port of Boston until three elements had been met. The first two are subjective, the third one is objective. One, that the East India Tea Company had been remunerated for its losses. So you can quantify that. The tea was worth X. When Boston pays the East India Tea Company for its losses, check, that's done. Two, the injured customs officers had been remunerated for their losses. That's also quantifiable. You can put a dollar amount to that and pay it off. The third one is objective. This is up to the king. That peace had been sufficiently restored that trade could resume. So in other words, when the king, on the advice of his Lord North and his parliament, surely was convinced that peace had been restored, then they would lift it. In other words, you're just going to be punished until I say so. There's nothing you can do that will make me act automatically like the first two, pay off the debts. You're going to have to convince me that you deserve it. No wonder they were so angry about this, these intolerable acts. Now, this is the easy one. They get better. The Administration of Justice Act empowered the governor of Massachusetts to remove trials to another colony. It's also called the Murder Act. So you're a British soldier, let's say, right? And you rape, you pillage, you murder somebody. The idea in our culture is that you will be tried for your offense by your peers, the Administration of Justice Act, the Murder Act, says that that soldier could be plucked out because an impartial jury won't be found in Massachusetts, Boston Massacre notwithstanding. You will be plucked out and sent to another colony or best to England. In other words, they're never going to really face justice. The third one, my personal favorite, the Quartering Act. All right, so can I pick on you? He looks like a rebel. He looks like somebody who would be rebellious. Somebody who might be one of these colonists who are fomenting rebellion. Yes? Look at him. Yep. Okay, good. So you have an army of occupation. 
in North America. You have the colonies who are host to an army of occupation coming from England. England has the responsibility to house, to quarter, to feed, to supply these troops in, well, what's becoming a hostile environment. We also know that amongst our population, there's a number of rebels, a number of people who are suspect. What better A plus B equals C, we're sending a squadron of soldiers home with you tonight. Let's say there's going to be eight of them. And they're going to live with you for the duration. And you're going to feed them. You're going to clothe them. You're going to give them fire, candles, vinegar, salt, bedding, cooking utensils, and up to five pints of small beer or small rum mixed with two pints of water per man per day. And this is going to be at your expense. There's no remuneration. We're not going to pay you back for your out-of-pocket expenses. And it's going to be until we say so. Two birds with one stone. Right? You have your occupation army being fed and clothed and, and quartered. And what better way to keep an eye on you? You're not going to be up to any shenanigans. You have people living with you who are reporting to me, right? The governor, the military governor. The Third Amendment of our Constitution we're going to see is a prohibition against quartering of soldiers. There's going to be a direct relation between the intolerable acts and our Bill of Rights. Now, obviously, in North America... During this period, it made sense. Under our Constitution, it makes no sense. doesn't mean, though, that Article 3 doesn't have play in our lives. You ever hear of the right to privacy? The idea of a right to privacy? It's nowhere in our Constitution. The word privacy is nowhere in our Constitution. The prohibition against quartering of soldiers is founded in privacy. The idea that a, a, a person's home is their castle Yes, that you have a right to privacy in your home. This is your property. This is your domain. It goes directly to this, this intolerable act. So there's a direct correlation. The Massachusetts Bay Regulating Act, the elected assembly, republicanism, right? Remember our culture, republicanism, smaller republicanism, is replaced by a mandamus council, a mandamus manual, a hand-picked council by the governor whose general gauge, who happens to be the military commander of the colonies at the time, the main English general, is going to be replaced by his council. The governor was given the power to appoint or dismiss all law officers. This is code for judges. So if a judge displeased the general or acted against the interests of the crown, out of there, dismissed. Thirdly, there were to be no town meetings without royal assent. And believe me, royal assent was not forthcoming. So this culture of republicanism, of guiding our own fortunes, directing our own affairs, out of there. No more. And there were to be no elections of juries by the freeholders. Okay, your head wants to explode. Remember Magna Carta 1215? One of the foundational elements of Magna Carta was the right to trial by jury. Going back to 1215, and this Massachusetts Bay Re Regulating Act, this Intolerable Act, is doing away with the Englishman's right to a trial by jury. This is martial law. And so thus we sum up our economic background that the founding generation saw as their inheritance, which includes the idea of an agrarian economic structure, the lack of banking, the lack of infrastructure, and through the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, and the intolerable or coercive acts, including the Boston Port, Administration of Justice, Quartering, Massachusetts Bay Acts, we are able to summarize in one paragraph what these economic forces might have been. Just as we did with history and with culture, I would suggest selecting one of these elements to dive a little more deeply in your examination. Remember, we're looking at the background as it's going to be reflected in the Declaration of Independence. So before perhaps thinking quickly about what you're going to choose, remember to read the Declaration of Independence, and we'll do that at the end of today's lecture. And again, pick the one that most interests you. That will make for the best essay and for the best reading. All right, so having summed up the economic background, we now turn our attention to philosophy. Next in our examination of the seminar question is the impact of the philosophy 
extant at the time the drafters were writing the Declaration of Independence? And how can we see those influences reflected in the essay and subsequently in contemporary American political society? This examination leads us down this path of examination. First, to study the nature of ideology. The second, methods of examining ideology. And then, what the sources of ideology are, i.e., political so socialization generally, the philosophic influences on the founders. And then, what we want to do is take the real world application, i.e., classic liberal ideology in the American political economy. What we're going to be doing then is to examine the nature of ideas their influences on the Founding Fathers and how those influences are reflected in the Declaration of Independence and in today's political society. The nature of ideologies is that an ideology is a set of values, beliefs, and hopes, and sometimes fears, about how the world should work. This operates as a roadmap in our minds, telling us what we are seeing and how to understand and interpret what is happening. Resting on deeply rooted values and unconscious assumptions, an ideology also provides cues for us when examining contemporary events to determine if something is good or bad. In other words, it gives us something to place our judgment on. There are two ways of examining ideology. First, the fundamental or applied method of examination. The fundamental core level is the basic values and assumptions that form the basis of an ideology that gets ex expressed as a political system. In the contemporary United States, for example, there are six fundamental core values or ideas that seem to exist. These include individualism, property, contracts and law, freedom, equality, and the capstone democracy. Individualism suggests that no country in the world has as deep a cultural commitment to the idea of individualism than the United States. In the United States, the role of the individual serves as the self-evident starting point for thinking about the nature and purposes of political and social life. So we've determined the fundamental aspect of individualism, i.e. we've defined it. Next is to look at it pragmatically or at the applied level. In other words, when the rubber meets the road, when we're looking about us in contemporary society, how can we see individualism expressed? So pragmatism is an approach that assesses the truth of the meaning of these theories or beliefs in terms of the success of their practical application. Again, practical application is nothing more than what does it look like when the rubber meets the road? So for individualism, then, pragmatically examined, we look about us for evidence of individualism in contemporary American political society. And I would argue that if you went out to Facebook or to Twitter, space, you would see a self-evident starting place for an examination of individualism. The core concept of things like Facebook and social media is I, the individual, expressing myself, what I think, what I feel, what I wear, what I've done, what I've eaten, what I'm going to eat, what I'm doing. These are all aspects of individualism. Having watched Facebook explode from a handful of users to over a billion users currently is really self-evidence of individualism. So again, individualism applied is when the rubber meets the road, what does it look like when I look about me? So this is my example, but I encourage you to look about you and to find examples of individualism. Hey, one good example is that you're taking this class. You're listening to me provide this lecture on the core fundamental ideas of classic liberalism. Why? For self-enlightenment, to achieve an education, to get a degree, to go on to get a higher degree, perhaps to increase your level of understand, understanding. But I would argue most likely that nobody is forcing you to take this class. Nobody is forcing you to listen to this lecture. Therefore, this is an individual choice for you. That is an exemplification of individualism at play. Your participation in political society is done by your individual consent. Okay, so this is one. Two, the next would be property. As we're going to talk about in a moment when we study John Locke and his influence on the founding generation, ownership of property is the vital goal of the individual in the United States. 
The right to hold property, to be secure in its possession, and be free to use it as one wishes, is considered a natural right of individuals, fully equivalent to the paramount rights of life and liberty. So, so we suggest, then, that the fundamental definition of property is ownership and the right to use or to do away with our individual property as we see fit. Again, then we look at a pragmatic approach. How does this express? Well, again, if you're taking this class for credit, if you're taking it for a degree, what you're doing is you're working toward an end. You're working toward the gaining of property. The property in this instance, then, would be your degree. Your degree will be something that you own, something that you'll be able to carry with you for the rest of your life. One would hope that not just increasing your level of understanding in the world and your uh, liberal education, you would be able to trade this degree in the marketplace for a higher salary. So you're working toward this degree, toward an end, and that end is property. So your time is your property. You're choosing to spend your time listening to this lecture to get a degree. You're going to be able to use your property, your degree, to further your life's purposes, to further your participation in political and economic society. So you as an individual earning property, the ability to earn it and to keep it or to do away with it as you will. This, again, is the pragmatic examination. The next would be contracts and law. The rule of law is the basis for life in a republic, and that which distinguishes us from a democracy, as we're going to suggest in the next chapter. Freedom and equality are the twin pillars of, uh, in the American political order. Freedom and equality include the idea of negative freedom, which is the absence of restraints or the absence of government action, putting uh, restrictions on your movement, on your dress, on your right to property, um, on your ability to enter into contracts, um, and your ability to participate in the lawmaking process through our elected representatives. Positive freedoms, on the other hand, are affirmative actions on the part of the government to increase the opportunities for individuals to achieve their fullest human potential. And so a positive freedom would be, for example, state-supported education. So the taxpayers of the state of California gather and pay taxes to support a state-sponsored educational system in higher education. The community colleges, the Cal State, the University of California, these are all examples of a positive freedom. Again, affirmative actions on the part of the government to increase the opportunities for individuals to achieve their fullest human potential. A couple of uh, interesting side examples would be the law necessitating use of safety belts, or if you ride a motorcycle, the law making it mandatory in California that you wear a helmet. Finally, we have democracy or the super value. Democracy is the American superlative. In the procedural definition, it focuses on the rights and the mechanics for participation. In other words, your ability to actually go to the voting booth and cast your vote for elected representatives. But there is also a definition at the fundamental or the core level of substantive democracy. In other words, there is a focus on a fair and open process in the United States, in the campaign and in the election processes. And one would have to have been living under a rock during the 2020 campaign and election and the subsequent wrangling in the courts and in Congress over the results of the 2020 election. So this aspect then of fairness in the campaigns and elections is endemic to our sense. So this is substantive uh, democracy. So look about you again, and how is democracy expressed in contemporary American political culture? We're going to see it to a great extent in the Declaration of Independence um, very shortly. So this leads us to an examination then of six key fundamental and applied ideas that are extant in 
the United States political economy. Again, they include individualism, property, contracts and law, freedom and equality, and democracy. So we see these looking about us in contemporary society. The seminar question also asks us to look within the Declaration of Independence for evidence of these philosophies. But before we go there, we really want to see how and why our founding generation had these ideologies as well. I would argue that there are a number of classic and then contemporary philosophers, political philosophers, who lent their wisdom to the founding generation. These include Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Rousseau, Paine, Kant, Locke, and Edmund Burke. We start with Plato, writing in 360 BCE, talking about the, the allegory of the cave in his work, The Republic. The allegory of the cave is an example of pluralism and the role of participatory democracy in our contemporary political economy. The allegory of the cave is really quite simple. What it tries to do is to express the nature of pluralism and democracy in ancient Athens, but I would argue it's very applicable to our lives today. It's really quite simple. Here's how it goes. And I'm going to paraphrase this, but if you're interested in the allegory of the cave, I really encourage you to go out and read it in its entirety. It's always available online very easily. Here's the idea. You're born in a cave, and from your youngest days, you're chained in the dark, and you're only able to see what's immediately in front of you. What that is, is the wall of the cave upon which faint shadows are cast. You see movement, you hear sounds, but they don't make a lot of sense because you don't see what their origins are. All you can see are the reflections on the wall. But since this has only ever been your reality, you don't realize that they're simply shadows. You think they are reality. Until one day, somebody comes along and breaks your chains. They rise you up and they begin to lead you out of the cave. On your walk out of the cave you realize that behind you what had been is a raised walkway upon which human beings, animals, mm, the world passes by that is being reflected from a fire further beyond the walkway casting those shadows that were on the wall. You realize at this point that you had only really been seeing shadows, that they were simply a reflection, and a faint reflection of that, of what was actual reality. But you had no idea that this reality existed until somebody came and broke your chains and began to lead you out of the cave. You continue on your walk out, and you, you leave the cave with this person, and you realize as you walk into the sunshine that there's an entire world out there. There's birds and fresh air and trees and water and lakes and people and cities and civilization and learning and astronomy and, oh my goodness, that the world is just full of learning that you had no idea even existed until this one person came and took the time to free you. The allegory of the cave is quite simple. You can see where this is going. Don't you then, as an individual, have a responsibility to go back into the cave and to go to those people who are still chained, the people who are chained next to you for all those years, and free them as well. Don't you have a responsibility to them and to the person who freed you to try to let them know that there is a reality beyond what they've experienced that exists? Now, when you go into the cave and you try to convince people that there is a different reality, a common reaction is going to be one of fear, disbelief, mistrust, and simple mockery, that they're not going to believe you. They're going to think you off your rocker. They're going to tell you to go away and leave them alone, sometimes quite vehemently. Does that mean then that you give up? Don't you still owe it to yourself and to the person who freed you to go to the next person and try to convince them of what this new reality is? Ah, okay. So all of us come to 
the political discourse as the sum total of our experiences in this life. This is called political socialization. When all the books you've read, all the people you've met, all the conversations you've had, all the songs you've heard, all the lectures that you've had are all people who are striking your chains and leading you from the dark cave. So don't you have a responsibility to all the people who have educated you, who have told you what their worldview is, and return the favor by going to those people who you consider should know what your reality is? Isn't this the case then in a democracy, that we all have our different worldviews, and our responsibility is to share those worldviews with others, to share those worldviews in the public discourse? This is pluralism, the vibrant marketplace of ideas that Thomas Jefferson talked about, where we each have not only a responsibility, but an obligation to share our political views with one another. <clears throat> Plato, writing then in 360 BCE, also discussed the differences between oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. And so he says that in oligarchy, which is the rule of the group, material temptations create often a confusion, confusion between economic status and honor, which is responsible for the emergence of oligarchy. Democracy, then, as, as this socioeconomic divide grows in oligarchy between the haves and the have-nots, so do tensions between social classes. From the conflicts arising out of such tensions, democracy replaces the oligarchy that preceded it. Finally, tyranny, or what Madison called the tyranny of the majority, when the excessive freedoms granted to the citizens of a democracy ultimately leads to a tyranny, the furthest regressed type of government. These freedoms divide the people into three socioeconomic classes, the dominating class, the capitalists, and the commoners. Aristotle, who is Plato's student, is going to continue Plato's thesis in 334 BCE, when he says that some people think the qualifications of a statesman, a king, a householder, or a master are the same, and that they differ not in kind, but only in the number of their subjects. The distinction which is made between the king and the statesman is as follows. When the government is personal, the ruler is a king. When, according to the rules of political science, the citizens rule are, and are ruled in turn, then that same person is called a statesman. Aristotle furthers Plato's examination of oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny, suggesting that you can have a pure m monarchy when the monarch is enlightened, uh, benevolent, kind, and wise. But should that one, the rule of one, the monarch, um, become um, sullied with mm, perhaps the quest for power, ambition, um, or uh, ego, in other words, when that monarch is perverted, or dirtied, sullied, the monarch becomes a tyrant. So too with oligarchy. Aristotle suggests that aristocracy can also be the rule of a group that is benevolent, kind, wise, and enlightened. But should aristocracy become benighted, then it becomes oligarchy in Plato's meaning. Thirdly, and most importantly for us, he differentiates between polity and democracy. Polity is the idea of the people self-governing, whereas democracy, the rule of the mob, the rule of the group, is the perversion of democracy. So just as when a monarch is sullied, or just when an aristocracy is sullied, so too can the people be sullied. And when they are sullied, they become a democracy, or the tyranny of the majority. The first of our philosophers from the uh, more contemporary era to our founding generation will be Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes lived between 1588 and 1679. So you may remember from our earlier part of this lecture, we tied a string around our finger when Thomas Hobbes was born in 1588. This was at the time of the Spanish Armada during the reign of Elizabeth I. Thomas Hobbes is also going to be the tutor of the young Charles II, the Restoration Monarch, coming after the Commonwealth. He wrote a work called Leviathan in 1651. 
Leviathan asks, what happens when a ruler is no longer able to protect? What is the state of nature that man is in when there is no overarching authority to keep him in check? He suggests that it comes down to bellum omnum contra omnes, or a war of every man against every man. So what Hobbes is talking about is the social contract. If we come together to form a social contract and we create an authority that has enough authority to keep us in check, keep us in line, what happens when that authority is gone? And so obviously what he's doing is he's writing for Charles II or the future Charles II as he's tutoring him in France in the absence of a strong monarch in England during the Commonwealth when Oliver Cromwell and later his son Richard Cromwell ruled. And so it's with Hobbes and a couple of these other philosophers that I'm actually going to be reading from their work and you can search for Leviathan or any of these other cited um, essays to follow along or to delve further into the reading if you so choose. So Hobbes wrote in Leviathan, so that in the nature of man we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Secondly, diffidence and thirdly, glory. The first, competition, maketh man invade for gain. The second, diffidence, for safety. And the third, glory, for reputation. The first use violence to make themselves masters of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. The second, to defend them. The third, for trifles, as a word, a smile, a different opinion, or any other sign of undervalue, either direct in their persons or by reflection in their kindred, their friends, their nation, their profession, or their name. Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war. And such a war is as of every man against every man. For war consists not in battle alone, or in the act of fighting, but in a tract of time, wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known, and therefore the notion of time is to be considered in the nature of war as it is in the nature of weather. For as the nature of foul weather lieth not in a shower or two of rain, but in an inclination thereto of many days together, so the nature of war consists not in actual fighting, but in the known disposition thereto. During all the time there is no assurance to the contrary, and all other time is peace. Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, the same consequent to time wherein live, men live without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, nor commodious building, nor instruments of moving or removing such things as require much force. No knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So that's Thomas Hobbes in his examination of the social contract by looking at what happens in the absence of a strong central authority. Our next philosopher is the Baron de Montesquieu, writing roughly in 1748 in his work called The Spirit of Laws. Montesquieu talks about the separation of powers, mainly between a legislative, an executive, and a judicial. Now, remembering that Montesquieu is a baron, writing during the French monarchy, this is prior to the French Revolution, naturally he's talking about the executive being the monarch. And in looking at the judiciary, a judiciary separate from the legislative and executive powers. Here's how. Montesquieu writes, Spirit of Laws in 1748, In every government there are three sorts of power the legislative, the executive, and things dependent on the law of nations, and the executive in regard to things that depend on the civil law. By virtue of the first, the prince or magistrate enacts temporary or perpetual laws and amends or abrogates those that have already been enacted. 
By the second he makes war or peace, sends or receives ambassadors, establishes the public security and provides against invasions. By the third he punishes criminals or determines the disputes that arise between individuals. The latter we shall say call the judiciary power and the other simply the executive power of the state. The political liberty of the subject is a tranquility of mind arising from the opinion each person has of his safety. In order to have this liberty, it is requisite the government be so constituted as one man need not be afraid of another. So this sounds like the correction of Hobbes' war of every man against every man. So it continues, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person, or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty, because apprehensions may arise, lest the same monarch or senate should enact tyrannical laws to execute them in a tyrannical manner. Again, there is no liberty if the power of judging be not separated from the legislative and executive powers. Were it joined with the legislative, the life and liberty of the subject would be exposed to arbitrary control for the judge would then be the legislator. Were it joined to the executive power, the judge might behave with all the violence of an oppressor. There would be an end of everything were the same man or the same body, whether of the nobles or the people, to exercise those three powers, that of enacting the laws, executing the public resolutions, and that of judging the crimes or differences of individuals. So that's Montesquieu, writing his Spirit of the Laws in 1748. Next, we have the quintessential Age of Enlightenment philosopher, Voltaire. Francois-Marie Arouet de Voltaire, writing in the Philosophical Dictionary of the Philosoph, says, As a rule, there is no comparison between the crimes of great men who are always ambitious and the crimes of the people who always want and can only want liberty and equality. These two sentiments, liberty and equality, do not lead straight to, count, to rape, assassination, poisoning, the devastation of one's neighbor's lands, etc. But ambitions might, and the mania for power, plunge men into all these crimes, whatever the crime, whatever the place. Popular government is in itself, therefore, less iniquitous, less abominable than despotic power. The great vice of democracy is certainly not tyranny and cruelty. There have been mountain-dwelling republics who were savage and ferocious, but it was not the republican spirit that made them so. It was nature. He also said, It is clear that men, in the enjoyment of their natural faculties, are equal. They are equal when they perform animal functions and when they exercise their understanding. The king of China, the great mogul, the Pasha of Turkey cannot say to the least of men, I forbid you to digest, to go to the privy, or to think. All animals of each species are equal among themselves. Animals, by nature, have over us the advantage of independence. If a bull is wooing a heifer, uh, if a bull which is wooing a heifer is driven away with the blows by the horns of a stronger bull, it goes in search of another mistress in another field and lives free. Equality is innately born amongst animals, and only strength or intelligence uh, creates the divisions. Next we have Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who lived from 1712 to 1778. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau is going to actually write what is called the Social Contract, which is a treatise, a political treatise on uh, the social contract or how we come together to live with each other, to live under the rule of law. Rousseau is going to take a different tack, tack from Hobbes. Hobbes says that we come together under a social contract out of fear, that we fear each other so much. Rousseau is going to come to the same conclusion that we come together, but he says not out of fear, rather out of love. So again, Rousseau writing in uh, the social contract, man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One thinks himself the great master of others, and still remains a greater slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. What can make it legitimate? That question I think I can answer. 
If I took into account only force and the effects derived from it, I should say, as long as a people is compelled to obey and obey, it does well. As soon as it can shake off the yoke and shakes it off, it does better still. For regaining its liberty by the same right as took it away, either it is justified in resuming it, or there was no justification for those who took it away. But the social order is a sacred right, which is the basis of all other rights. Nevertheless, this right does not come from nature. It must therefore be founded on conventions. Before coming to that, I have to prove what I just asserted. The problem is to find a form of association which will defend and protect with the whole common force the person and goods of each associate, and in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. Every free action is produced by the concurrence of two causes, one moral, i.e. the will which determines the act, the other physical, i.e the power which executes it. When I walk towards an object, it is necessary first that I should will to go there, and, in the second place, that my feet should carry me. If a paralytic wills to run and an active man wills not to, they will both stay where they are. The body politic has the same motive powers. Here, too, force and will are distinguished will under the name of the legislative power and force under that of the executive power. Without their concurrence, nothing is or should be done. We have seen that the legislative power belongs to the people and can belong to it alone. It may, on the other hand, readily be seen from the principles laid down above that the executive power cannot belong to the generality as legislature or sovereign because it consists wholly of particular acts which fall outside the competency of law, and consequently of the sovereign, whose acts must always be laws. The public force, therefore, needs an agent of its own to bind it together and to set it to work under the direction of the general will, to serve as a means of communication between the state and the sovereign, and to do so for the collective person more or less what the union of soul and body does for man. Here we have what is, in the state, the basis of government, often wrongly confused with the sovereign whose minister it is. What, then, is government? An intermediate body set up between the subjects and the sovereign to secure their mutual correspondence, charged with the execution of the laws and the maintenance of liberty, both civil and political. So again, that's Jean-Jacques Rousseau writing the social contract. Our final philosopher will be John Locke. John Locke is important especially in his examination of the rights of property and government's job to assure property, to assure the right to hold and to keep property. And so John Locke is writing his work called The Second Treatise of Civil Government. I'm reading from chapter 2 which is subtitled, Of the State of Nature. To understand political power right and derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in, and that is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. A state also of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than that the creatures of the same species and rank, promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculties, should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection, unless the Lord and Master of them all should, by any manifestation, manifest declaration of his will, set one above the other, and confer on him, by an evident and clear appointment, an undoubted right to dominion and sovereignty. And here, obviously, Locke is referring to the divine right of kings. This equality of men by nature, other philosophers look upon as so evident in itself, and beyond all question, that it makes it the foundation of that obligation to mutual love amongst men, 
on which he builds the duties they owe one another, and from whence he derives the great maxims of justice and charity. His words are, The like natural inducement, what has brought men to know that it is no less their duty to love others than themselves, foreseeing those things which are equal, must needs have all one measure. If I cannot but wish to receive good, even as much at every man's hands as any man can wish unto his own soul, how should I look to have any part of my desire herein satisfied, unless myself be careful to satisfy the like desire, which is undoubtedly in other men being of one and the same nature? To have one thing offered them, repugnant to this desire, must needs in all respect grieve them as much as me, so that, if I do harm, I must look to suffer, there being no reason that others should show greater measure of love to me than they have by me showed unto them. My desire, therefore, to be loved by my equals in nature as much as possible may be imposed upon me as a natural duty of bearing to them full affection from which relation of equality between ourselves and them that are as ourselves what several roles and canons natural reason hath drawn for direction of life, no man is ignorant. But though this be a state of liberty, yet it is not a state of license. Though men in that state have an uncontrollable liberty to dispose of his person and possessions, yet he has not liberty to destroy himself, or so much as any creature in his possession, but were some nobler use than its bare preservation call for it. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges every one, and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind, who will but consult it, that all being equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. For men, being the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, all the servants of one sovereign master sent into the world by his order and about his business, they are his property, whose workmanship they are, made to last during his, not any one's pleasure, and being furnished with like faculties, sharing all in one community of nature, there cannot be supposed any such subordination among us that may authorize us to destroy one another, as if we were made for one another's uses, as the inferior ranks of creatures are for ours. Every one, as he is bound to preserve himself, and not quit his station willfully, so by the like reason, when his own preservation comes not in competition, ought he, as much as he can, to preserve the rest of mankind, and may not, unless it be to do justice on an offender, take away or impair the life, or what tends to be the preservation of life, liberty, health, limb, and the goods of another. So this is John Locke, Second Treatise of Civil Government, Chapter 2 of the State of Nature. Excellent. So then what we've done, again, just very quickly, is to examine the role of ideas, or an ideology, on our founding generation. What we're looking at then is called the Age of Enlightenment Ideals, or Classic Liberalism. This isn't liberal as in liberal versus conservative. I try to use the term progressive when contrasting that to conservatism, as that seems a more likely fit. Liberalism, in this sense, again, is the ideology or the set of ideas that were extant at the Age of Enlightenment, the late 1700s, the early 1800s, wherein the founding generation penned the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So, once more, our seminar question is asking for the influences of philosophy on our founding generation, and how do we see that influenced in the Declaration of Independence and subsequently in contemporary American political society. And so, by examining philosophy, I introduced the role of ideas and the nature of ideologies being a belief, hope, value about how the world should work. I suggest that there were two methods of examining ideology, the fundamental 
or the core examination, or the applied or pragmatic level of examination. I introduced six key pillars of classic liberalism or Age of Enlightenment ideals. They include individualism, property, contracts and law, freedom and equality, and democracy. We learn then that the sources of these ideals come from Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Rousseau, and Locke. In further examination, Paine, Kant, and Burke in their writings at the time of and subsequent to the Declaration of Independence will confirm these, these ideas as well. So again, looking at the founding generation's influence in the Declaration of Independence, our next task then is to examine the Declaration of Independence, which you'll find is attached to your chapter one as an addendum. You can also very quickly Google any copy of the Declaration of Independence online, or if you prefer, there exist several dramatic recordings of the Declaration of Independence, many of which are easily discoverable on YouTube or via Google video search. So, my friends, this brings us to the end of our lecture today. Again, our seminar question was, what were the influences of history, culture, economics, and philosophy on the drafters of the Declaration of Independence? Can you see those influences reflected in the essay and subsequently in contemporary American political society? At the beginning of our lecture, we turned this seminar question into a thesis statement, and from that thesis statement, created an outline. It should be about eight paragraphs, roughly, including your introductory and concluding paragraphs. You know, this is a what, two and a half hour lecture, and so I understand that there's a lot of information to process. Yes, as the way it should be. I jokingly mentioned in the beginning that this could be a multi-volume set of books to answer this question. My hope is that using your editing skills, you'll get down to the brass tacks of what it is that we're looking for. It's a tall challenge, and I appreciate that. Give it your best shot. I'm here to work with you and to make sure you are successful in this class, and I take that responsibility very seriously. So please, if you have any questions, or if you'd like any more information, I am at your disposal. My phone number, my email address, are all listed on my homepage, and I really encourage you to make use of those. Again, thank you for joining us in class today. Our next class will be on the Constitution, and I look forward to seeing you then, as well as to reading your essays on the Declaration of Independence. Again, this is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to United States Government Online. Thank you, and have a great day.